Good morning. Hey, glad you're with us, and I uh, hope you can uh, reach close by and grab your Bible. Hopefully, you've got it ready. It's important that we have our Bibles ready so we can turn to passages, we can read, we can see these things for ourselves. And um, today, we're going to continue our study in 1 John. I mentioned we're getting really, really close to finishing this epistle, but I'm taking my time a little bit because the things that we're learning about as we go through this are are important. We don't want to just sort of roll through a bunch of different ideas, but rather we want to take our time and let the passage breathe a little bit that we might understand what it's ultimately saying. And so that in uh, in view, let me invite you to look at chapter 5, verse 13. This is where we're going to pick up where we left off last time, where John is writing. And, and I've mentioned before how much I love John's writing, his lofty view of Christ, his highly elevated uh, descriptions of the person of Christ and the majesty with which he writes when he's when he's writing about the person of Jesus and um, the the sense of of wonder that he experiences as he's trying to find the words to explain how uh, the Word who is eternal was with God but was God in the beginning with God and the Word became flesh. These are uh, these are best efforts to explain something that is. Uh, really kind of unknowable, how it is that um, the, the nature of God really is in the triune uh, fashion that God exists in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Father, Word, and Holy Spirit uh, before the Incarnation. Uh, again, just wondrously lofty ideas that he is speaking to. Well, interestingly, uh, to sort of uh, flip the coin over, he uh, in, in the passage we're going to look at today, he talks about a couple of truths that are also very, very lofty, but these pertain to what we have in Christ and that kind of thing. And so, uh, again, he speaks of these things, these ideas that we could read through them very quickly and sort of just move through the passage. But to stop and, again, let the passage breathe a little bit and just take some time to explore what John is talking about, uh, really, there's such a rich... Uh, a couple of truths here that we want to spend a little bit of time on here today. So let me invite you to turn your attention to uh, 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 13, picking up where we left off last time. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now we're going to go through a couple more verses after this, but let's just kind of camp out here for a minute. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, there's a couple of times throughout the letter, uh, I think, uh, gosh, what, four or five times we've already seen this expression, uh, I write these things to you, and then he explains why he writes these things. Uh, You know, for example, early on, chapter 2, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. Um, um, uh, What is this? Uh, Verse, chapter 4, I think it is, where he says, uh, I write these things to you, uh, I had it here, I thought, just a second ago, but I write these things to you in regard to false teachers and things like that. He makes it very clear, the various elements as to why he's writing this letter. Well, this last particular one here, um, it is such a, uh, a wondrous truth. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Uh, this is so central to our faith. And, and by the way, when I say central, um, it not only touches on the central elements of what, it, what belief is about, but it also begins to speak to the assurance that comes with belief in the truth. Um, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Uh, you know, we see in the book of Acts, you know, there's no other name given under heaven by, when, by which men must be saved, Peter would say. The idea that um, uh, kind of echoing Jesus' own truth about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. This idea of the, um, let me scoot this just a little bit. Um, this idea of the simple, central truth of the Christian faith is that it is rooted in the person of Christ. It's not about how well we keep the rules and regulations or any of that kind of thing. It is about who we know and know personally, and that he knows us as well. You know, the idea that he has saved us and set us free, and he is the only one who can save and set free. Again, as Peter says, there's no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. 
So for you who believe in the name of the Son of God, he had just said in the previous passage, uh, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Again, it is so central that we understand that there is no other way for men uh, or women, people, to be saved except through the finished work of Christ. And so he continues on this idea that I'm writing to you who know the Son of God, who uh, ultimately uh, believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, this is something that people wrestle with tremendously. Uh, There are people that wrestle constantly with the question, am I saved or am I not? Can I have lost my salvation? Do I really uh, have confidence in knowing that when I die, I'll be with the Lord? Um, Well, John is, is sort of connecting the dots here between belief and the consequence of belief, or the benefit of belief, or what what happens as a result of belief. And that is that there is an assurance that can be embraced that if you believe in the name of the Son of God, then you have eternal life, okay? Um, And he says that you may know that you have this. Now, the word know there, K-N-O-W in English, the idea to know, is generally expressed um, by a couple of words in Greek. Uh, One is the word gnosko, the idea that I know something. Uh, But the other word is oedo, I think it's pronounced. Uh, And this speaks of a a, a sure knowledge, a perception of your actual situation. The idea that you are not only just sort of aware or that you think you know some things, but this is, there's like a, a certainty to this. There's the idea that you're standing on something that you know. Okay, it's generally used in contrast to the word gnosko. In other words, it's it's like gnosko, sort of a lesser kind of know. It's like if you had if you had known this, then you would know this. And the idea being that if you had had a true knowledge of this, and this is the word gnosko, then you would have known uh, oedo, the idea that you have this certainty. This is the word that John uses, the idea of the certainty, that you may know this, that you could stand on this, that you can absolutely anchor to this truth. You are absolutely sure of this, that you have eternal life. Have is a, an active present verb. The idea is that you currently have this, okay? Not someday, maybe, or whatever. No, you know with certainty that you have current, present possession, the idea of, of, of this, this is a presently active thing. You have this currently. You are holding this, right? You have this in your hand, eternal life. Now, it only makes sense that you would talk about eternal life in, and use a verb that is a present active thing. You have this. Uh, the idea is that this is an ongoingly true thing. And how can eternal life not be that? If you have eternal life, it means you have a life that is eternal, forever. Now, the word there for eternal life, aeonia zoe, speaks not only of of time, but also of a quality of life. It is a different kind of life, fundamentally different than the life we currently experience. However, it also does speak of the ongoing element of it as well. How can you have eternal life if it ends? In other words, you can't have eternal life yesterday and not eternal life today. Why? Because it wouldn't be eternal then. It's, it's a very logical idea that, that John can just very freely say because a believer has this ongoing, eternal, perpetual, and always currently in the present has it. And we know this with certainty. Think of the ironclad nature of what John is saying here. He is saying for those who believe in the name of the Son of God, you can know and should know and do know is the idea that he's prodding is that you, you should know this with certainty that you have eternal life. Now, that is so extraordinarily liberating. Uh, It also answers some of the fundamental theological questions about what it means to be saved and how you can be saved. For example, if if your salvation depended upon your works, okay, notice he says, believe in the name of the Son of God. This is somewhat of an echo of John 3.16, right? Um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, would have everlasting life, life that lasts forever, um, uh, you know, by belief, right? There's, there's no works element in, in that equation. There's no works here that are stated. The idea is that by belief, 
in the right thing, not just sincerity and belief in something, but belief in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. If you have that belief in him, then you can know a certainty that you have eternal life. If your eternal life was based upon your works, your performance, how well you kept things up, or what was in your past, is there anything unforgivable? There's nothing you can do about any of those things. The only thing that can be done to rectify the the catastrophic condition we were in is for someone to reach in and save us. All that is left is for us to trust him to have done that. To have done that, past tense. He's not going to do it one day. He's already, Jesus, and having gone to the cross, has paid for our sins. The only work that could be done to accomplish that has been done by him. This is the beautiful good news. All that is left is for us to simply believe that, to put our faith in him. Uh, In Romans chapter 4, verse 5, Paul makes the case of the idea that our belief is not a work. It's not an effort that we do. The Bible even speaks of our faith kind of being a gift, right? So really, this whole thing is of God. And so we don't have to live in doubt or fear or concern about our salvation being based upon our works because it never has been. It has always been through God's grace by faith. Um, Um, You know, and of course, the New Testament is replete with this. The Old Testament, this is also true throughout the Old Testament. Um, And so when we read a passage like this, boy, is it important not to just sort of read through it and move on to the next thing. This statement is earth-shattering. I'll say it one more time, then we'll move on. The idea that you can, if you believe in the name of the Son of God, He is your Savior. You've put your trust in Him and the finished work that he accomplished, it's him, and you've put your trust in him, then you can have absolute knowledge, certainty, that you have present possession, present active right now, eternal life, life that is eternal. If you could lose it, it would not be eternal. It would be temporary. This is something you can know with assurance. Now, this is important because when we think about grace, we think about the gospel, um, there is a natural tendency on our part, and, and, and frankly, lots of people preach something like this. The idea that it's by grace, but somehow your efforts in walking with Jesus have something to do with whether or not you stay saved, as if there's sort of this blending between the law and grace. Well, Paul, you can't read Paul on this subject and, and come away with the idea that there is somehow this combination of works and grace that somehow results in your salvation. The only work that was done was done by Christ. We believe what he did. And through that belief, through that grace, really, by faith, that we appropriate it, uh, we ultimately find that we are saved. You can't add to grace. And so, therefore, if it is by grace, it is only by grace. It cannot be by grace plus. So, a lot there, but I like to really emphasize that point. Um, A friend of mine and I, who we talk regularly about this subject, uh, reminds me, uh, and I don't spend lots of time watching lots of YouTube channels, but um, apparently there are tons and tons of YouTube channels out there. Um, and I'm not trying to sound like the authority, I'm not. But when we talk about grace, uh, I'll go to the mat on this one for sure. But there are a lot of channels that really try to blend works and grace. That's Again, I don't watch lots of YouTube channels, but my friend does see a bunch of me. He just He talks about how often he comes across people who are preaching the gospel, but there's always this element of you need to somehow be involved in either your salvation in, in, in doing something to earn it or to somehow keep it. That's a complete misunderstanding of the gospel. We don't work to earn grace. The works that we do flow from the grace that we've received. As a matter of fact, turn to one, just one more thought on this. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, Verse, we, typically, we can quote verses 8 and 9, but we should really recognize verses uh, 8, 9, and 10 uh, as, a, as a unit together. Um, again, chapter 2, verse 8 of Ephesians, we know these first two verses probably by heart. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, again, we know that passage. We probably have quoted it many times, right? But verse 10 follows along with it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Well, there it is, right? We need to do good works. Notice what he says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, Even when it comes to the working, he lays those things out in front of us. 
But in connection with verses 8 and 9, it's not so that we can earn salvation, but just like it comes later in the passage, in concept, they also follow grace. These things are done as a result of the grace that we've received. If we are doing them to earn that grace, then we have the whole thing backwards. We're still under the law. Paul, throughout the book of Romans, makes a strong uh, and ironclad argument against that kind of thinking about what the law was all about and how it cannot be intermingled with grace. It is different, and it is intentionally meant to be seen differently. And that has always been, as Paul says, God's intention when we understand the law and we understand grace. So back in 1 John, if we feel like it's based on our works, we're never going to have the kind of ironclad knowledge, certainty, and knowing for sure that we have present eternal life, life that is everlasting and never ceases. Um, Again, impossible to be everlasting life if it's only temporary for you. You never had eternal life then. Well, why not? Well, because you didn't believe in the name of the Son of God. Well, I do. Well, then you have eternal life. It's, 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 it can't, it's just that simple. And so that's a massively profound comfort-bringing, assurance-bringing, security-bringing concept that John just says, okay? In other words, we should read that, see that, let it say what it says, and rest in it. That's the beautiful benefit of belief in Christ, is that we can have peace. And so this is one of the things that we know. Here's another thing, uh, back in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. Now, same kind of thing here. There is a confidence. This is the confidence Um Confidence is based on trust, belief, the knowledge that whatever it is can stand, can, can endure, can accomplish the purposes, can fulfill a promise, whatever it might be. Um, this is the confidence that we can have, okay? Uh, let me just, uh, in terms of an example for confidence, I, um, I like to share this. Back years ago, um, uh, I led a youth group, and um, one of the very first youth groups we had uh, we had a handful of kids in there, and um, uh, all about high school age, and uh, junior high and high school. And two of the kids in particular, I had them come up to the front. Uh, one was this little girl. Her name was Leah, and she was just very petite. I, if she weighed 100 pounds, I'd be shocked, just soaking wet. I mean, she was just a, a petite little thing. And then there was this other kid, Eddie, who's big, was like six foot, you know, 180, 200 pounds, something like that. I don't know exactly, but he's a big kid. He's the kind of kid you'd see playing football or something. And I had Eddie stand in front of Leah. I had Leah stand behind him. And Eddie had his back to her. She was standing behind him. I said, okay, now, Eddie, here's what I want you to do. I said, this is called a trust exercise. They do this in business and all this kind of thing, but it helps us make our point here now when it comes to faith or confidence and trust. I said, Eddie, here's what I want you to do. I want you to just close your eyes, put your hands, you know, in front of your chest like this, and just fall backwards and let Leah catch you. Well, as soon as I said that, they both, you know, Eddie's like, his eyes got all big, and Leah, her eyes got all big. She's thinking, she's, he's going to crush me. I can't catch him. And he's thinking, I can't fall on her. I mean, she won't be able to catch me. I'll land on the ground, I'll crush her, and this kind of thing. And so clearly they both recognized that this was totally not going to happen. And I knew that. I knew he wouldn't really do it. And I was close enough by just in case he was getting cheeky about it and decided to do it anyway. So, but I said, okay, well, good. That's, that was a point I was trying to make. Now, Leah, you go ahead and sit down. And then I got behind Eddie. Now I'm 6'4", I'm, you know, about 230, that kind of thing. At the time I was probably about 200 pounds. I've gotten a little older and a little wider. Uh, But, um, so I got behind Eddie and I said, okay, Eddie, let's do the same thing. But now this time, go ahead and fall back. Well, he had no problem doing it. He backed right, just fell right back. I caught him, of course, because I could. Uh, there was no no fear whatsoever that that was going to happen. He had total, complete, absolute confidence that he would not be hurt because I could catch him. And I, of course, had confidence that I could catch him. I was big enough and strong enough to do that. And so um, John is saying, here is the confidence. You can know with absolute certainty that this will hold up. This will not fail. This is not something that you have to doubt or question or be concerned about. This is the confidence that we have toward him. 
Again, Christ is at the center of the equation. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. This is one of those really, really rich promises in regard to prayer. Uh, If we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And by extension, we we know that we have that request. Now, Jesus often spoke about prayer, and this is such an enormous topic for us because prayer is something that that often is misunderstood and often misapplied. James would say that, you know, you have not because you ask not, but you, uh, you know, but but when you ask, you also ask according to your own desires and that kind of thing, and he condemns that. And so the idea of, of not asking is wrong, but the idea of asking just according to your own desires, like personal gain and that kind of thing, is also something that is spoken against in Scripture. But... If we ask anything according to his will, we have what we ask. In the Gospels, Jesus often speaks about asking in his name, right? The idea of in his name and in his will are not two different ideas. There's a basic premise that underlies both. If we're asking something in Jesus' name, it's not like a formula in Jesus' name, and I get what I want. But in Jesus' name speaks of the idea of that which would ultimately honor him. It's being done in his name. Uh, for example, you know, um, um, uh, it, it, Matthew chapter 7, you know, hey, didn't we do miracles in your name and cast out demons in your name and all these great deeds in your name and everything? And Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. And so they, they thought they were simply doing things in Jesus' name, but there was the absence of something fundamentally important in their lives, and Jesus never knew them. We ought not think of the in your name as like some kind of a formula, like like sort of a quarter in a vending machine sort of a thing, and then you press the button, you put in the right thing, you push the right button, you get what you want. That is not what prayer is all about. That's not what asking of God is all about. But rather, asking in his name, or as John would say here, in his will, according to his will, the idea here is that which he himself would do that which he himself sees as the right thing to do. Not, what we want does not always line up with what he wants. The invitation to prayer is not to ask contrary to the will of God, but to ask in accordance with the will and that which would bring honor to his name. And so prayer has this fundamental starting point, his will, his purposes, his glory. Uh, Never our will, our purposes, our glory. No part of the Christian life is about that. Least of all prayer, that connection we have with God to ultimately ask for those things that would help accomplish his purposes. Now this, of course, becomes the rub because oftentimes what we see as the right means for God to accomplish his purposes is just what we see and so we pray for that and we sometimes don't think that there's any other way for God to accomplish his purposes because we can't see any other way. But what if God can see another way? That shouldn't surprise us. Remember, in Isaiah, he says that my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are higher than your, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, right? And so the idea that his thoughts and ways are much more elevated than ours speaks of the idea that he sees things from a very different vantage point. So when we ask and pray, um, this causes us to oftentimes um, get a little confused about prayer. And, uh, and, And when we pray, maybe the better way to put it is that sometimes the rub for us is how can we pray with confidence if we don't know that he's actually going to do the thing we're asking him to do? Because what if he wants to do something different? Well, the thing that you're asking for primarily is that his will would be done. The secondary thing is the expression, I think this is how your will would be accomplished best. And so here's why I'm saying it. But the end game is not the thing that I'm praying for materially speaking or circumstantially speaking, the thing I'm actually asking for is that his will would be done. Okay, well, that changes things, right? As a matter of fact, we often pray, um, uh, you know, but in any case, let your will be done, right? Now, uh, again, a friend and I and I talk about this a lot and, and, and you know, we come, have a laugh sometimes because we tend to think, that when we, when we add your will be done, nevertheless your will be done at the end of a prayer, it sort of becomes kind of an out for God because we're asking for something, 
but we're not really praying in faith, and so we're sort of giving this out in case God doesn't answer the prayer the way that we are asking him to do it. But again, that raises a fundamental concern about what it is we're actually asking for. Am I asking for something to take place? Am I asking for a circumstance to change? Or am I asking for his will to be done? And I openly share what I think would be the way for his will to be accomplished in that. But ultimately, I'm asking that his will would be done. Not mine, but his. No one exemplified this better than Jesus himself, who in the garden prayed that very way. Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass by me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so the idea is that Jesus asked for this cup to pass by in, the, in regard to the crucifixion and the, and the momentary separation from the Father. Why have you forsaken me in that? He says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Well, the will of the Father was accomplished in the crucifixion, right? What was the will of the Father? Salvation, freedom from the penalty of sin, the way of salvation and, and grace being poured out because of this finished work and all. Um, when we pray, we would do well to think the same way. You know, in, in any given circumstance, I might say, well, this seems like this would bring you the most glory. This would be the way out through this whole thing. But nevertheless, your will be done. What do I mean by that when I say your will be done? I mean, at the end of the day, you know better than I do. You know what's ultimately going to bring you glory. You know what ultimately is going to bring the best end. And so therefore, let your will be done. Someone once said that this is not a concession. This is a battle cry. Lord, let your will be done. Matter of fact, we pray it in the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your will be done on earth. Change everything. Do every, you know, if we understand what we mean when we pray that, we understand that let your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We're essentially asking God to just completely upend everything in the whole world and turn it, turn it right side up. You know, it's upside down currently. He's just, Lord, change all of it because it's all completely messed up. Change it and bring your will and your kingdom. Well, when we say that same thing in our typical everyday prayer life, Lord, I want to see this person healed. Father, I pray you provide in this way. Father, I pray you'd work these circumstances out in such a way as to be glorified and, and we just pray this person would get to go this way as opposed to this way. And we just sort of lay out what we think would be the thing. But underlying it, we're not asking just for that thing. We are asking that God's will would be done. Um, because... What if, what if the thing that we put forth as, we, as what we're sure is God's will isn't? Would we want him to do that anyway? If the answer is yes, then we probably have some humbling out to do because we're sort of indicating that we know we want something more than God's will or maybe we think we know better than God in regard to what his will should be. Asking God to, to do his purposes and to fulfill his purposes for his glory is best left in his hands. He doesn't mind us laying out the thing in particular. He invites us to pray for healing, right? The, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much, James tells us. Uh, Jesus went and he, he, he talked about people's faith making them well and this kind of thing. On the one hand, and this again is the rub, it's the, it's the tension that exists in prayer, is that we pray fervently, we pray through, we pray consistently, we lay something down here and say, God, we want this to be changed. We want this to be done. Lord, let your will be done. To the best of our knowledge, this is, this is what we see as the, the obstacle or the thing or whatever it might be. We pray with confidence. We ask in belief. We don't doubt and all of that. But we also recognize that we could be misguided in some element of our prayer. And so we leave room and say, Lord, at the end of the day, if your will is different than mine and your will is always right, then line me up with your will and you do what you think is the right thing to do, what you know is the right thing to do. Um, there are lots of examples we could give of this, but it's enough for us just to consider that idea as we pray. John here speaks about the idea if we ask anything according to his will. The according to his will part is not a letdown for us as believers. Well, what if his will isn't to do what I think is the best thing? No, if we ask anything according to his will, we know we have what we ask. We have absolute assurance that God will do the thing that is according to his will. And that should bring us great joy, not disappointment or whatever. We should be thinking, yes, let it be so. You have done excellently. You always do excellently. Father, have your way. Whether it's in us, in someone else's lives, in someone else's circumstances, 
whatever it might be, whether it be healing or provision or anything, at the end of the day, Lord, you know the right thing. You're working all things out according to your foreordained counsel. You are doing all these things according to your will and your ways, to the desired outcome that you have in mind. Father, I am on board. Do what you will do and let your will be done. That doesn't sound like concession. That sounds like God bring it, you know, and that's the kind of confidence we should have. We should ask with full confidence and assurance and faith. But remember what we're asking for at the end of the day is that his will would be accomplished for his glory. And we want to be enlisted in that. And so um, much more can be said on prayer, but I just wanted to kind of just take these two concepts today, the idea of the assurance of our salvation, of our eternal life that's been given to us because he has given it to us through his grace by faith uh, when we put our trust in this, in this in the name of the Son of God. And secondly, that same confidence, and some of the same wordage is used here, by the way, in terms of the second thing, prayer, that same knowledge of absolute certainty, that same having, present tense, active, the idea that we have what we're asking for. Well, I'm asking for God's will to be done. I've got it. What does that look like? Here's what I think, Lord, but at the end of the day, I know you are going to do excellently. And so I have absolute confidence in that. Um, When we think that through, the challenge we often have with it is because sometimes his, again, the idea of his ways being higher than ours, his wisdom being greater than ours, our unwillingness to admit that maybe we're not seeing things from the correct position, vantage point, um, all those kinds of things. If we know God and we love God, then that means we trust God and we're willing to leave things in his hands that he might accomplish things the way he wants to. Um, you know, sometimes he gives us he gives us a sense of confidence in the very thing we're praying for. And so maybe that bolsters us and we pray with even more confidence in that. But not always. Sometimes we don't know what God's will is in something. Sometimes, again, he brings a sense of assurance of that. And so we pray accordingly. But ultimately, at the, at the foundation, at the fundamental bottom of it all, we want to see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So... Um, I'm going to stop stop there today, and then uh, we'll go ahead and move into uh, another big issue. Uh, The next time we're together, if you want to read ahead, you'll probably trip right over what I'm talking about as being the next big issue. Uh, But we'll talk about that next time we're in 1 John. So let me encourage you to read ahead on that. And for now, I'm going to go ahead and pray us out. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them below on our YouTube channel. You can go to my website at parsonspad.com, where you also can subscribe to the audio version if you would prefer to do that. Um, And then, uh, of course, you can go to our website at calvarychapelfranklin.com, and you can learn more about our fellowship here in Middle Tennessee. And as always, we invite you to come out and join us and worship alongside and Bring your Bible with you as we uh, make our way through it together on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, those kinds of things. So thanks for joining once again. Let me pray. Father, we're thankful for the confidence that you give us in you, that by belief in your Son, putting our trust in him, we can have such total, absolute sense of assurance and security uh, that we are safe and secure in his hands, in your hands, and nobody can snatch us away from you or your Son. And so, Father, we thank you again for that rich confidence that you give us, that we have eternal life in you. Father, we also thank you that when it comes to prayer, that we can have equal confidence, that we can know that your will and your purposes will be accomplished, because of course they will. You're the Lord. You're going to work out those things that you desire, and you are good. And not only are you good, but your end is good. And so we just thank you for those things that you're working out. And we just pray that you'd help us to see things the way you do, that, Father, we would uh, be humble enough to pray with absolute confidence that your will would be done and we would be uh, happy and satisfied and blessed in the knowledge that you are accomplishing your purposes and that we could pray and sort of come alongside and ask you to do those things that you know are right and good. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, for those uh, that with whatever prayer needs are on our hearts and minds right now, Um, I have things in my mind. Others that are watching and listening have things going on in their lives. Uh, We pray that you would teach us more and more every time to leave these things in your hands, to hand them over to you, and to simply ask that you would work in these things. And Father, um, you know, whether we feel like we see the right way or the best way or that, at the end of the day, we know you do. And so help us to leave these things in your hands, trusting that you will bring a good end in the way that you desire that will glorify you. Uh, And we thank you that we are safe and secure and our prayers are safe and secure in your hands. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you and bless you. 
and ask you to help us to continue to grow in our relationship with you as we make our way through your revealed word. Thank you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.